Thank you, thank you everybody. Um, super happy to be here and sharing my, uh, whatever knowledge I have about design systems here. Uh, this is basically a talk about, um, first of all, this is no wisdom. This is some of the learning that we had while we were making our design system in Pacto. And uh, <coughs> what we eventually understood and realized that, that uh, whatever we were building in terms of components, because we did our own research and built our atomic design structure, that we all know that how to build, and whoever is building a design system will know about Brad Frost atomic structure. Uh, but there's a lot more beyond that. And finally, when we kind of completed the entire design system process, we started calling it our design meta system because it was much beyond a simple set of components or design systems that we typically talk about. So I'm going to just share our thoughts and views on that, that how we came about doing this. Okay. So the design meta system, uh, so yeah, so let's start with like, There's a lot of buzz in the industry around design systems. We are aware of its beauty, but we are concerned about the consequences. In Practo, again, the design system was required to be built because we wanted efficiency in the system and we wanted design consistency. This is something which is very common. Everybody of us know that why we want to build the design system, right? So, um, so we built our design system, which was called the Omega. Okay. So, um, but it was not a one-shot process. Just to give you an idea that how we went about uh, crafting our design system, it was around in 2017, we started developing our principles, the product plus design principles. Then we had a project called Project Aurora. Okay, the Project Aurora was basically where we were trying to uh, build our UX in terms of, initially we were a very task-oriented uh, UI. We wanted to go to a more platform, uh, uh, transaction-focused, uh, platform that uh, so that that entire UI paradigm was changing. So that project plus the principles framed a bit of the direction that we wanted to go about building our system. Then in a later part of in, in between, we started developing the research around that how a design system needs to be built. We went and talked to, spoke to uh, Ola, we spoke to uh, Gojek and a couple of other companies that how they are working on the design system, brought the learnings back and then uh, started around sometime in the later half of, I mean like uh, around November, December, we started building our ATEMPs and then we built our components in 2019 early. Then we had a version 2.0 and then 2019 quarter two, we started working on adoption. Now we'll come to all of that, that why adoption is a separate process altogether, but uh, fundamentally we kind of broke down every step of the design system into, uh, 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 so that the, the, the fundamental reason was that Practo is a, as a company, as an organization, we try to measure everything. And for us, it was very important that we are able to measure the impact of all of this as we go forward so that we can uh, take a decision based on the outcome of that measurement. So that was the fundamental reason why we're doing this. So um, by doing this, we realized that what we are mostly dealing and discussing about the components of the design system, which is only a part of a larger system that we started calling, and I, start, I call as design meta system, right? So, so this is, uh, so our design meta system has basically three layers. We have a central core, which has the rule engine. We have the components, and then we have the adoption or the measurement layer. And these together uh, come together to kind of make, make the design meta system and make it a self-evolving system. So, so it's very important to understand that where the concept of the design meta system comes from, and it actually, it's, it's comes some, I mean like, some of the core can be understood by this book but, uh, because this is something that I read long time back. Have, has anybody read Michael Crichton before? Okay. He's a writer of Jurassic Park, um, The Lost World, Twister, Congo. I mean, most of the science fiction which has been made into a movie. So, uh, Westworld, anybody on HBO has watched Westworld? So, Westworld is written by um, uh, Michael Crichton. So, Michael Crichton's book, Prey, if you read it, it, it talks about uh, self-emergence system, and emergence is a, is a, is a, is a very standard and a, and a large part of computer science software uh, uh, discipline. So the fundamental uh, thought around our design meta system is that it has to be a self-evolving emergent system, right? And uh, <coughs> that's what we're going to talk about. So if you look at it, so we have to first understand the concept of a self-evolving system. So you guys look at these birds, Okay, and we have all seen these birds fly in this shape. Now, do you know that why the birds fly in this shape? I mean, how do they decide to fly in this shape? Is there a bird which kind of knows that where it has to fly? Um, but before we come to that, 
let's understand that why they fly in this shape. They fly in this shape because um, this optimizes the energy using the advantage of aerodynamics of the bird ahead. Because they fly in this shape, the aerodynamics, they're able to use the, the wind draft of the bird in front of it, and as a result, end up using lesser energy, and they are able to migrate farther, and probably this is the way for the nature to kind of evolve and um, um, you know, survive. So fundamentally, the success metrics of this is survival, right? Now the point is, the interesting part of this entire, uh, the, the, you know, the structure of this, uh, the formation is that no bird knows that they have to fly in this formation, okay? So <laughs> the interesting part is that this is not achieved by a plan, but by following simple rules rules that are genetically coded in the system, like being able to sense the aerodynamics so that the birds know something like, I have to keep this much distance from the next bird based on the wind draft that I'm getting, and maybe at this angle, and that's how the shape evolves. There is no single bird which is the leader of this pack. There is no single bird which knows that I have to be on the third or fourth position. This shape evolves when the birds take flight together, and they just follow those simple rules. So this is the fundamental uh, concept of uh, an emergent and a self-evolving system. Has anybody uh, uh, ever seen a Conway's Game of Life? So I'm just, that, that's out of the topic here, but in case you guys are interested, because that kind of demonstrates a, um, a self-evolving system, because this is from Conway's Game of Life, it's a grid structure, and each, um, uh, uh, each um, grid part is basically treated like a cell and the black swans are the living cell and which is not filled is a, is a dead cell. So go and read about it. The interesting part is that these structures are evolving out of only four or five basic rules of life and death of those cells. And people have demonstrated that extremely complex behavior could evolve out of these systems, right? Now, um, <coughs> so fundamentally what I'm trying to put forward here is that design systems need to be an emergent system. They need to have so what are the, what are the uh, fundamentals of basics of an emergent system? It needs to be a continuously evolving system, right? It has to continuously evolve because if you look at it, these are generations. So in a, in a game of life, there are generations that run and as a result, a system or an organism evolves, right? A decentralized system evolved from the fundamental and basic rules, okay? So there are certain basic rules which have no correlation to the whatever the larger system that evolves out of it. But the system evolves out of that, those basic rules. A system with a known measure of success, of course, there has to be a measurement, because unless you measure it, it cannot feed back into the system. And a system that can be measured and evaluated against the success metrics, right? So, so these are the fundamental requirement of a uh, emergent design system. Now, this is what the design system in, in our case looks like. Okay, so we typically talk about the component library, which is the second part, second layer of the design system. The first layer are those rules, right? Those rules which are going to make and build a component. And ideally, in, in, in some, some time in future, probably if we work enough hard enough on the rules, the components will evolve automatically, right? And then we have adoption, which is basically the process of measuring the success of the design system and then evolving the design system by that process, right? So, uh, so I will just take you through each of these step by step that how did we do it and the, the important parts are the rules and the, uh, and the adoption part. We'll go slightly deeper there. We haven't cracked everything out there, but we have cracked part of it and that's what I'm gonna share here, right? So some of the rules we typically know of, like the brand guidelines, right? The color, typography, illustrations, images. These are something given to us by the brand uh, by the brand and we kind of use it. Of course, there's a lot of research that goes back uh, in, in deciding that what font and why should be used and stuff like those. These are some of those fundamental rules. But we have also design principles. We had our design principles that we built to kind of come to those some of those rules. But fundamentally, I would like to uh, you know, talk about this one particular rule, which is typographic density and contrast. Okay, so, um, to give you an understanding of what a typographic density and contrast means, let's look at this. This is Airbnb, this is Zomato, this is Amazon, right? And they have separate typographic density and contrast. This is, so first of all, what is a um, typographic density means? Density, typographic density means 
the baseline, the base font size that you're going to use for all your content, mostly it is for mobile either 12, 14, 16, right? Now, somebody like Airbnb would use a 16 font size as the base size because that's where the readability comes from. And also, something that adds to it is the line height, right? Combination of these two will give you the density. So if you look at it, this is more dense. Okay, this has much more spacing if you look at it overall. I mean, like even between these at, so what is the ratio? It's 1.5 versus 1.8 or 1.6. And even the variation of that ratio can lead to a very different style or uh, usage of the product. Why this matters? Because a lot depends upon how much content you are showing in a consumer facing app, right? And if you look at it, these guys, they show less content, but they're okay with it. Why? Because they have a better brand um, uh, present, I mean, they, their brand is a larger brand. So people are going to spend time not because they want to do something immediately, but because they are on Airbnb for some reason, and they're going to stay there. They're going to scroll and see all the content against maybe, you know, Zomato, which is trying to say that all of this here and, you know, like everything is on the first screen. So this has a very deep correlation to the state of the business. And, and that's why this is very important. So this is high density, this is medium density, and this is low density. But let's look at the contrast. This is very high contrast. With contrast, what I mean is that the lowest font size and the highest font size, the, the ratio between that. So this is a very high contrast, and if you see, there is very hardly any difference between the contrast of this um, you know, interface. In this, it's a medium contrast. So what we did was that we kind of made a dispersion of density contrast of all the, some of the apps that we could see. So if you see everything here, Flipboard, Nike, Apple, these are like, this is a quadrant where most of the premium looking uh, apps are there. And they can be here because Apple doesn't try to achieve transaction or conversion on their app all the time. They get people on their app via marketing and via building the brand, right? So most of these organizations here uh, will be using that as a lever to kind of bring people. So they don't need to show too much of content. But most of the other places, like Mintra, Swiggy, Amazon, Zomato, you have a lot of content. And you need to be somewhere here. But if you look at some of the other ones, like Craigslist, Quora, they have like very dense GitHub, very dense, very low contrast, because they have too much of content, and it goes up here, which is very functional. This is premium. This is somewhere which is the hygiene plus premium, right? Uh, Zomato, if you see that Zomato has a very quick cycle of iterating on the density contrast, and they keep redesigning their, uh, their, their app. They keep moving here continuously, depending upon what is the state of the business. So after looking at it, we decided where we want it to be. And that's how we came to practice density and contrast. And that's how we designed our uh, interface. So it is somewhere in between, you can see, right? Um, so fundamentally, what I'm trying to put forward here is that all design decisions, now previously, these kind of decisions were taken by designers on gut instinct. I created this, and I think this is good. Okay, as a, either as a head of design or the lead designer who is building it, he feels, which is actually right, because the gut might be right, but there is a reason behind it. And this kind of helps us to bring that on the table for the, to the larger management and the developers. That why did we select a 14 by 20 density and 14 by 20, uh, 24 uh, contrast? So those measurements help. Those measurements give us a lot of confidence on the design decisions that we take, right? So after this, so the fundamental idea is that the rules must be connected to the state of the business, right? So if tomorrow my company decides to spend more on advertising and brand building, I will pull my levers of density and contrast and change it from being somewhere in between to somewhere more premium. So I will take it, I will, I will make it move along this metric somewhere depending upon where the business stands for, right? So, um, so this is about the rules. This is one of the rules. We had a lot of rules which we kind of deconstructed and kind of built on those. And that kind of gave rise to our components. The components was built on the concept of the atomic design structure. 
we had the atoms, we had the molecules, we had the components. Okay, uh, we built the anatomy of our each um, you know button, and then we had the dimensions of them, like how much padding and stuff that will go into it, the states of the um, of, of each component. They are checks on the black background because we had a blue as one of our brand, and we kind of built on that. And usage, right? Um, iconography. Um, uh, looking at the tutorials and fixing them, we had some of the previous icons had a lot of flaws in terms of spacing and everything. We kind of uh, removed all those flaws. And then finally creating the rhythm by space system, which is something connected to the density and typography that we're talking about, right? And by this, we kind of created almost 210 uh, <laughs> components. Now that's a huge set of components, but that was primarily because Practo already had multiple businesses which we are having their own separate set of components. And the idea was not to uh, just come up with a design system and say that, hey, why don't you use this? We wanted to kind of inculcate and bring in the design, uh, the components from each, uh, each business units and the you know, parts that we're working on. We assimilated them. And the idea was that once you start measuring them, you can start optimizing it. But we first start with having everything, include everything, be inclu as inclusive as possible, right? This is some of the screens and um, uh, 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 the app screen and the, uh, the web screen that we kind of designed out of those components that we built. Mm -hmm. The second most important part is the process adoption and measurement. So uh, the process adoption and measurement, because again, like I said, we have a culture of measuring everything. So even for us, the important part was that whether the design system is successful or not. And we have to figure it out, right? So there are two paradoxes to it, one was the process and the second was, was the framework. That what is the design process that allows the integration of the design system because if we don't follow a process of, uh, because the process is going to give us the checkpoints where the design system is getting used so that I can measure on those checkpoints. Unless and until I have those checkpoints, I don't know where to measure. So the process was very important. The second part was the framework that allows for the measurement of the usage of the design system. That how are we going to define the usage, right? So. Again, these are like all very developmental uh, concepts and theories because uh, we had to work with the business to kind of understand that what can we build around this. The one thing that we did was that we set up an OKR around design system that, and, and since, like I said, that we had a legacy uh, uh, you know, usage of system, so we did not start by uh, having the engineering start building them immediately. The idea was that let's first measure that how much of the design team is using it. Because we already had the design team using different components and we have brought it all in within the design system. But the idea was to measure that how much of these in, you know, individual designers are using the design system, right? And then to take it to 90% because when it reaches 90% or adoption, then we can clearly say that this, is, this design system is at least successful with the designers so that now the design engineering, we have the confidence for the engineering to start building on it, right? So uh, for the process, we had to, I mean, the tool was very important. The, the abstract played, I mean, we, we used abstract for this. And some of the benefits of abstract was that it, it gave direct link to the design system library, right? It's kind of built to help you do that. We have other ones like DSM of InVision and some of the other uh, tools. Somehow abstract worked out financially and from whatever we are doing, right? The whole design process can now run on abstract. The process of design could now run on abstract, which kind of helped us to have those checkpoints to measure. The design review steps allows us to have a central review system, right? And allowing versioning and archiving of all design files. This was more tactical, not related to design system, but because of also this, we got abstract on board here. So if you look at the, the process, I mean, obviously everybody has a sprint process in the organization. So we had our sprint process and these were the three checkpoints which we found. Uh, so this is where the backlog grooming happens. Okay, and this is where the pre-handover happens and this is where the handover happens of design. Now, whenever the uh, backlog grooming is happening and the design project is decided, it has to initiate on abstract. So we measured the initiation, we measured the review um, on this, and we also measured the handover. If all these steps are happening on this, then we say that design system process adoption is 100%. Sometimes 
designers fall through this. The idea is that they should not take much time because ideally everybody should follow this process. But since we were migrating from one to another, we even measured this, this entire transition. Uh, we had naming convention, of course, to kind of help them with um, a very, very specific naming uh, convention. And then we used runner to kind of, uh, this is just to help you guys to understand that how, what are the various uh, uh, tools that goes into helping build the design system because without those associated tooling, it will be very difficult for the designers to kind of use the design system, right? We were using Sketch. So, so now coming to the measuring of the adoption of design system, abstract plus Sketch, right? So this was the combination that we had to use. Now to just to give an example that how adoption can be measured. So the adoption, so, so this is, let's say this is a project which is, uh, so what we did was that we did sampling. So after a month, we would take four or five large projects, which has full screens, like let's say two or three big screens. And then we would see that when the designer has uh, designed it, how many of those components are, you know, from the component library versus some of those independent floating items or something that he has to build for that particular project. So this ratio of this green versus green plus red gives you the adoption ratio, right? And this gives an idea that where we stand in terms of usage of this, um, uh, the components. So uh, this was a hacky way, but the interesting part is there's a lot of work going on. So one of our, uh, there's a lot of work going in this, in this area where people are trying to automate it. And to be honest, the tools today we have don't really help us to measure because if you even if you look at uh, Adobe XT or uh, Sketch or uh, because this this measurement can be very well built within the Sketch, right? When you're using it, and in fact one of our ex Practo um, uh, designer who is also a brilliant uh, developer, he actually built one a tool called Lint, which is now being used by Google and a couple of other large organizations abroad. It kind of uh, gives you, throws you back that how, you know, like if you have used this, this is the right component to be used and it connects back to that component and tries to uh, help you to, you know, uh, identify the right component that you should be using instead of that. And what he's right now working on is a fuzzy logic system on which he can build. Uh, um, so the idea is that because if you guys are using Sketch, you would know that a lot of time we kind of disconnect the symbol, detach the symbol from uh, the symbol library and then modify it. The idea is that even if you modify it, it's going to get caught in the development cycle because the developers are going to say that we have this component, you have modified it. But even if you modify it, you can use fuzzy logic to understand or a little bit of AI ML to kind of figure out that whether this is the same component or not. So they are trying to build a system where you are able to understand that this is the same um, uh, component and give you some recommendation that you can improve it, you can use the same one, and give you a measurement also that you have used this much of component versus what, right? So this is how kind of, um, th this is a development in the space and we kind of worked with him very closely to understand if we can build it for us. We haven't done that yet, but we are in the process of doing it, right? Uh, integration with the tech, like I said, that uh, it's very, very critical because uh, we, uh, at the other end, we had the storybook version of the, all the components, which is what we are building right now as a second uh, stage of the process where the developers keep all the components and they are visible and there's a hell lot of document that go, documentation that goes on to that to kind of figure out all the various states of it, right? Um, so this is fundamentally the, the system that we use in Pacto. So we have an abstract version, we have a storybook version, we have UI on production, and this is a design sprint, right? And uh, there's a review that happens between this and this, which is the Omega adoption rate, right? And then in the process of evolving, there's an Omega release cycle, which kind of goes and updates the storybook version. Then there's a parity scan. This is a very difficult stuff to do, but actually it's possible. Uh, we have not done it yet, but this is something on the pipeline, is that understanding that how much of that design system which we see on storybook is on production, right? And again, of course, this design handover, kind of completing the circle, right? Uh, this is basically that we learn from the UI production that which of the components are actually working fine, 
are they successful? So PayPal and stuff like those, they do this a lot. Uh, they, they actually s check the success of, against, of each component against their business metrics, right?